Well, good evening, everyone, uh, both those joining us virtually and those who are here in person in our reading room. Uh, and if this is your first visit to the Library Company of Philadelphia, welcome. We are so excited and happy that you could join us this evening. My name is Fran Dolan. I am the Director of Operations for the Library Company. And it is really exciting to people have people back here. It's been over two years since we have had an in-person public programming. Um, and so we're psyched. This is really important for us. Um, over the library's long history, we've grown um, a great community of scholars, shareholders, and event attendees that share the library's passion for knowledge and learning. Um, during the last two years, we've managed to stay connected with so many of you through virtual programs um, in a lot of ways. Uh, but that doesn't mean we haven't missed seeing all of your faces, even if they're masked most of the time. Um, so it's great to have everyone back. Um, it was really important for us to just open the doors and get people inside of this building. So much of what we do takes place here in the reading room. Um, and so it's, it's great to see everyone again. The Library Company of Philadelphia was founded in 1731. It's an independent research library concentrating on American society and culture from the 17th through the 19th century. It's free and open to the public. The library company houses an extensive non-circulating collection of rare books, manuscripts, broadsides, ephemera, prints, photographs, and works of art. Our mission is to foster scholarship in and increase public understanding of American history before 1900 by preserving and interpreting the valuable materials in our care. To that end, we host a wide range of free public programming, which is what brings us all here this evening. As always, I'd like to acknowledge our members and shareholders whose support makes so many of these events possible. You can check out our website if you're interested in learning more about shareholding, including access to member-only events that happen throughout the year. I'd also like to give a big thanks to Blanche Brown, our events and program coordinator, who put together much of tonight's program and is back there handling our live stream for this evening. Thank you, Blanche. Um, at the end of tonight's presentation, we will have a Q&A um, if you're watching from home, you can submit any of your questions through the Q&A feature in your Zoom. And if you are here in person, you can just raise your hand, um, give us some kind of signal that you have a question and we will get over to you. And then following the program, there will be a reception in the living room. Hope to see all of you there. And tonight is our opening event for Power and Pomp, which is Fashion History Month at the Library Company of Philadelphia. Each Thursday in April, we will examine the ways in which clothes and textiles shaped and were shaped by structures of power in the 19th century United States. We are thrilled to begin our month long series with Tools of the Trade, Women and Textiles in the 19th Century, a collaborative effort between the library company and the textile and costume collection at Thomas Jefferson University. Um, after tonight's presentation, we do have a mini exhibit on display in the Logan Room, which will remain up all month. So if you're not here in person, please come back during our regular hours and you can check it out. Um, and the mini fe features items from the textile and costume collection. And now I'd like to welcome our speakers for tonight. Jade Papa is a costume and textile historian. Currently, she curates the textile and costume collection housed at the Design Center on Thomas Jefferson University's East Falls campus. She brings to her work not only extensive experience in object preservation, identification, and research, but an intense curiosity about how these objects shaped and were shaped by the people and cultures who wore the garments and created textiles. This interest sprung from her experiences as a theatrical costume designer and maker. She has contributed to a number of books, journals, and magazines, and is an experienced lecturer. Emily Radomski is a third-year undergraduate student at Thomas Jefferson University working towards a Bachelor of Science degree in textile design. She has experience in print and weave design and is building a concentration in knit design with aspirations of using this knowledge in either the fashion or home interiors industry. In her academic career, Emily aims to absorb as much information as possible and to increasingly challenge herself in future projects. Emily's position as a collection intern at the textile and costume collection helps elevate her knowledge through learning about the textile industry and how, how it historically operated. We are very fortunate to have Jade and Emily join us this evening. So without further ado, I'll turn it over to the two of you. Thank you so much. Thank you for that lovely introduction, Fran. So hello and good evening to you. Um, I don't really have to introduce myself. Fran already did that, but um, 
I am so pleased to be here. Um, those of, again, those of you who are in person, those of you who are online joining us, this is um, my first in-person presentation in over two years. And my goodness, it feels good to be back in a room again with everybody. Um, so I also want to give my great thanks uh, to the library company for having us here this evening. Special thanks to Blanche Brown and Fran Dolan for reaching out and asking us to be a part of their month long series, Power and Pomp. We're thrilled to be collaborating with the library company and to be kicking off uh, this exciting lineup events that they have in store for us all this month. So as was mentioned, um, Emily and I both work at the textile and costume collection housed on Thomas Jefferson University's East Falls campus. As uh, I prepared to discuss the roles and history of women in textiles, in, in textile manufacturing in Philadelphia in the 19th century, it occurred to me that our university and our historic collection is actually a big part of that story. So let me start with a little bit of background about our university. So although it has gone through many name changes at this point, <laughs> um, uh, it began in 1884 as the Philadelphia Textile School. So after the Centennial Exhibition in 1876, a group of local textile manufacturers noticed that Philadelphia, a city where textile manufacturing was already a huge part of the local economy, um, was, was falling behind. Uh, we were falling, our city was falling behind. They were not keeping pace with our rivals' capacity, technology, and ability when it came to textile manufacturing. So planning and fundraising was begun to create an institution that would train future textile artisans in the newest, the most up-to-date methods, thus ensuring the continuation of textile manufacturing in the city. And, Emily here is a part of that legacy. She's a testament to that legacy. So the textile and costume collection, the collection I curate, holds student workbooks, weaving samples, instructional material, and textile tools from those early days of our institution. When the university opened its doors in 1884, the Textile Association described to its readers in their publication, which was called the Bulletin, the benefits of our, the curriculum at our university saying, quote, we paid a visit to the school and we must say that we were greatly pleased with the evident practical turn which that university has taken, end quote. And they went on to describe that, quote, looms are to be set up that young men or young women either may be enabled to go out from this school fully prepared to enter a mill to design the fabric and put these designs upon the loom. We say young women because we think can think of no reason why women should not succeed in this occupation, end quote. So this emphasis on weaving opportunities for men and women um, was notable. While women had been heavily involved in textile manufacturing in the West for centuries, much of the written and pictorial records show women undertaking roles other than weaving. So it wasn't the case that women were never weaving in the home or sometimes even in mills, um, but the vast majority of weaving before and during the 19th century was done by men. And I will note that despite the optimism in the quote that I read you above, if we look at images of our university from its early days, most of the people attending were men. So this evening, we hope to illuminate the rule, roles that women did take at home and increasingly in the 19th century as it progressed in mills and how their skills, artistry and sheer presence were integral in positioning Philadelphia as a leader in textile manufacturing. Nearly a century after the opening of the Philadelphia Textile School, when the textile and costume collection, again, the collection that I curate, began in earnest, it was certainly the case that whatever women's contributions to the industry had been, textile manufacturing, this would have been in you know, sort of like the 1970s, textile manufacturing in our city was on the decline. 
So as yarns and weaving mills and upholstery and carpet manufacturers in the area closed their doors, instead of throwing their history in the dumpster, um, they reached out to us, to our collection um, with their samples, their tools, their designs and their paperwork. And so you're actually gonna see some of that this evening. We'll share that with you. I'm truly honored to be the caretaker of these pieces of history. Companies whose names have largely disappeared are remembered in our collection and we hold on to that material memory that those companies even existed. And I'm always excited about the opportunity to share those pieces with you, of course. So people often ask me how many objects our collections hold. And uh, my usual response is to sort of raise my shoulders sort of and my eyebrows in what I imagine is a, um, your guess is as good as mine gesture. Um, but if I'm being serious, I imagine that we have, uh, right now my best guess is that we have around 125,000 objects. Uh, it's a lot. <laughs> Even for a large museum with all of the resources that come with that, 125,000 uh, is an extraordinarily high number. And we are a very small organization and very small staff. So most of the work that I've undertaken in our collection over the past five and a half years that I've been there has been to inventory and digitize. And this year, Emily got in on the fun. She was tasked with inventorying our collection of textile tools. Being an experienced uh, and aspiring textile designer herself, I knew that her knowledge of not only knitting, but weaving would give her a leg up in understanding what some of these tools were and how they were used. And so far, Emily has uh, digitized and inventoried over a hundred objects in our collection. So she's literally at times brushed off the dirt and brought these pieces out of their dark corners and into the light. Um, so all of the images of the textile tools that you'll see in our presentation this evening um, were taken by, all those photographs were taken by Emily. And at the end of the presentation, I'm gonna share with you an online resource where you can peruse other tools from our collection that you won't see. So you'll have another opportunity, as Fran said, to visit them in the cases in the Logan room as well. So the people who make, and Blanche, there we go, thanks. The people who make the fabric that surrounds our daily lives are largely apparitions. While there's been a shift recently by some companies, some individuals to think about where our clothes are coming from, are they being ethically made? What are they being made out of? I'm not sure that this extends to thinking about the people who are manufacturing the textiles that these clothes are made out of. I think there's a similar blind spot occurring when we look at historical garments. We might think about the person who wore it, the occasion it was worn to, where it came from. But again, it's the textile manufacturer, the textile artisan who gets left out of that equation. And when these figures are pulled into sharper focus, and here is a result of some very clever Photoshop work by one of my colleagues, so thank you, Anne, uh, a record of people and a city at the peak of its manufacturing glory emerge. The tools that we'll discuss this evening in their makeup hold the memories of these individuals, the memories of their use in production of textiles in the, in the worn grip on a handle or the scratches on a weaving shuttle. These tools passed through people's hands and in many cases were an extension of that hand wielding it. Philadelphia could and did boast that it was one of the largest textile centers in those early days following the revolution. But larger scale production in a scale beyond just a single household was actually already established before the war for independence. Transplanted Europeans steeped in the rich textile traditions of their home countries brought those skills and their know-how to the colonies. For instance, Ben Franklin, which seems fitting, here we are at the library company, Ben Franklin invited Englishman John Hewson to Philadelphia, where John Hewson set up a print, dye, and bleach work factory in 1773. He was one of the first and certainly the most successful printer on fabrics in the colonies. 
And in that image that you're seeing on the screen, the quilt to the right side, that central block is a John Hewson printed block. And this is, uh, we're very fortunate to have this very rare example in our collection. There are 10 known quilts out there in the world with central Houston blocks and we've got one in our collection. I'm kind of scared to touch it. It doesn't come out of its box very often. Shifting into the 19th century, there we go. Shifting into the, the 19th century, um, manufacturing in general was the most important industry in Philadelphia, but it was in the field of textile manufacturing that Philadelphia dominated. According to Christina LaRocco in her work, Garment Work and Workers, quote, in 1850, Philadelphia was home to 10,422 textile workers, which equated to 18% of the total population. And by 1880, the number increased to 37,741 textile workers or 21% of the total population, end quote. At the time around, uh, at around the time, Hewson was busy printing vases, flowers and birds on fabrics. The image of the colonial woman spinning at her wheel is the domestic scene that might come to mind when we think about women's roles related to textiles. And while there is absolutely truth to this, that image, that image alone doesn't quite capture the magnitude of women's contributions. Women put in the long hours and undertook the physically strenuous tasks of processing fiber into yarn in their own homes with tools that would have been obtainable either by purchase or home manufacture. The book Manufacturing in Philadelphia, 1683 to 1912, is a source that documents Philadelphia as an increasingly industrialized city and notes that in the early 19th century, every good farmer owned sheep and that the processing of this fiber into wool yarns usable for weaving into fabric would have been carried out in the home. Many households were largely self-sufficient, producing for themselves what they needed and if fortunate, selling off any excess for extra money. And now I'm gonna take a brief step aside and uh, bring up Emily, who's gonna walk us through some of these early steps that could have been done by women in their homes. And she'll also discuss the types of fibers that these women would have been working with. So. So the three most commonly used textile fibers in the 19th century were flax, wool, and cotton. Flax and cotton are plant fibers, while wool is a protein fiber. Primarily, it was the men who would harvest the textile fibers, but women were responsible for every step in processing and spinning fibers into yarns. And to reiterate, these processes and tools I will describe were performed and used at home by women. Preparing fibers to spin into yarns was a process that started with hand-operated tools called hatchels and combs. Hatchels were most commonly used for flax production in which the large metal spikes inset in the wooden base would strip the rigid exterior of the raw flax from the fibers within the plant. This was an extremely tiresome task involving repeatedly lifting and raking the harvested flax through the hatchel um, secured to our working surface as shown in the image behind the hatchel in which those ladies are completing the process I'm describing. Some long coarse or hard wools were processed on a similar tool called a comb, which is shown on the right. Combing was a process done repeatedly with freshly sheared wool and the initial combing strips away any debris that was caught between the fibers. Uh, additional comb throughs after the debris was move, removed um, were done by heating the metal spikes in order to straighten and uh, remove natural roughness in the fibers when the wool was pulled through. Finer wool or cotton fibers were processed through a tool called carters. And this tool consists of two paddles with inset thin wire teeth. The raw cotton or wool fibers were placed into one of the paddles and padded into the teeth on that tool. Um, and this portion is also referred to as a single card within the tool carter. So the card would be rested on one knee of the worker while the other would be repeatedly dragged across the teeth of 
um, brushing the fibers in one direction. And so this action disentangles the fibers and arranges them in small rolls when removed from the card to prepare for spinning into yarns. And yarn spinning can be done through the use of many different tools, but the spinning wheel and the drop spindle are the two that are most widely used. The spinning wheel takes many forms and was used for spinning cotton, wool, and flax in the 19th century. The rolled fibers from the carters were rotated in rapid motion on the spindle as the worker repeatedly pressed the treadle with her foot while she gradually fed the spindle small amounts of fiber at a time as it began to form a yarn. When the desired twist was achieved, the freshly spun yarn was then wrapped around the spindle and the process was continued until the roll of fibers was completely spun into yarn. Spinning wheels were created to be a more efficient uh, formulation of their predecessor, the drop spindle. And drop spindles have an incredibly old history and they're still used today by crafters that make their own yarns. These tools are used to make a single ply yarn by attaching the rolled fibers from the carters at a notch at the top of the spindle. A weighted area of the central rod of the tool was either located at the top or the bottom to add momentum to the spinning motion after the tool was initially dropped, hence the name drop spindle. With this motion, the fibers attached to the spindle were twisted in one direction as more fibers were released from the roll by the worker. As yarns were created, the worker would wrap the twisted yarn around the body of the spindle, giving the tool a little bit more weight to aid in the spinning process while keeping the yarns out of the way for the next round of spinning. Single ply yarns produced from these methods could and often were spun again with another single ply yarn um, wound on spools to create a two ply yarn, which would result in a stronger fabric when used in weaving or knitting processes. Um, lengths of the yarn were then measured using a tool called a nitty knotty, which is named by the bobbing motion of the worker's head as their eyes would follow the yarn winding around the arms of the tool. The knitty knotty measures around two yards of yarn with one rotation around the arms. The wound yarns were then removed and twisted into a skein where at this point they could be dyed and washed and ready for knitting on a knitting machine or on a weaving loom. As Philadelphia continued to grow, and in that growth became more industrialized, the individual home as the center of production began to shift to mills and factories. In our modern parlance, we might use the term independent contractors to describe women who undertook some tasks in the textile manufacturing process at the behest of a mill or factory in their own homes, with the express intent that when the work was completed, it would be delivered for compensation at that mill. In the 19th century, this setup was referred to as the putting out or outwork system. Right before the turn of the 19th century, the Pennsylvania Packet and Gazette printed an ad that offered, quote, to employ every good spinner that can apply, however remote from the factory, and as many women in the country may supply themselves with the materials there and may have leisure to spin in considerable quantities, they are hereby informed that ready money will be given at the factory up Market Street for any parcel, either great or small, of hemp, flax, or woolen yarn. The manager returned their thanks for all those industrious women who are now employed in spinning for the factory, end quote. As industrialization continued ever onward and new machines that carded and combed and spun those processes that Emily just walked us through, uh, those process, um, be, they became replaced by machines uh, doing the work faster than anyone could have done by hand, these outwork jobs became fewer and farther between. Women looking to support families or save enough money to be married began to seek employment in the factories and mills. In a series of statistics put together by the United States government around the turn of the 20th century, it was, that, it was noted that amongst silk workers in Pennsylvania, the vast majority of women, 94.3% uh, were single, 4.3% were married, and 1.4% were widowed. 
One of the companies women might have gone to work for was the company, and you're seeing an example of their work here, F.W. Maurer and Sons. Maurer and Sons were manufacturers of fringes and trimmings for dress and upholstery in silks and wools. And we're very fortunate to have in our collection 16 examples of the gorgeous trims created by Maurer. These samples were actually donated to our collection by Joseph W. Maurer, and clearly his last name indicates some association with the company. And in looking for more information about this particular Maurer, uh, just a few days ago, actually, I came across an article in the Textile World Journal from May 27, 1916. It was an article about the alumni gathering for the Philadelphia Textile School's commencement. So here we are back to our university again because Joseph W. Maurer was a former student of our university. So my guess is that when that company folded, he thought, let's give it to my old school. It's been difficult to trace the exact start of this company. The earliest record I've come across thus far is a listing in Boyd's, a, a publication called Boyd's Co-Partnership um, and Residence Business Directory, which was published in 1858. There was a, a mention of F.W. Maurer. And it's also difficult to track down exactly where in Philadelphia in any given year this company was. Uh, based on accounts I've been able to find between 1881 and 1906, they moved four times. Um, and the number of samples that we have in our collection have handwritten dates on them. And based on those dates, the earlier ones were probably made when the business was located at seven and nine North Fifth Street. And those from a little bit later, right before the turn of the century, when the company was located at 529 Arch Street. And then clearly at some point they moved to Cherry Street. Um, in 1884, F.W. Maurer was operating with 14 hand looms and 12 power looms. And Emily's gonna go into the details of what the distinctions are between those in a moment. Six years later, they had grown and were operating with 17 hand looms and 18 power looms. At this time in the sort of mid to late 19th century, Philadelphia was the nation's marketplace for fringes and trimmings. Maurer was one of 52 firms in Philadelphia. The company at the top of that field, though, was a company called William Horstman and Sons. So William Horstman came to Philadelphia in 1815 from Germany, and like Maurer, the company produced dress and upholstery trimmings, but they also manufactured military goods. And while we don't have, there we go. And while we don't have any examples of um, trimmings or fringes that I've been able to find yet in our collection from Horstman, um, we do have uh, this example of this uniform. Uh, there we go. And so the back marks on the buttons of this Pennsylvania National Guard officer's uniform note that they were created by Horstman and Sons. In 1824, Horstman was the first American textile manufacturer to use the newly invented jacquard loom, a mechanical loom controlled by punch cards that became widely used in the textile industry. And I cannot overstress enough how Im the impact of this particular type of loom. Even today, jacquard looms weave the most complex textiles with the highest level of detail. And they're able to do that because of the total control that a weaver has over not just the weft yarns, but the warp yarns, warp and weft being the basic building blocks of a woven textile. And which warp yarns are to be lifted, allowing for the insertion of the weft on any given pass is dictated by the punch cards. And so on the right-hand side of the screen, you're seeing an engraving of a jacquard loom. And so those uh, punch cards that are cascading down from the top of the loom are what is you know, sort of directing the type of weaving, the weaving that's happening here. So where there is a hole, that specific warp yarn is lifted and where it's not, it stays depressed. And so in essence, these punch cards were the program or code by which to weave a particular design and fabric. And to some of you, those of you, you know, might be, these might be familiar to you because they're nearly identical to the type of punch cards used in early computing. So thank you, weaving. Um, but that's another story, another story of another remarkable woman uh, for another day. 
So whether they were produced at Mauer or Horstman, the task of braiding was performed by women who operated the machines that carried out this step in the process. So for instance, in this beautiful silk trimming that you see on the left-hand side of the screen, those um, ropes creating the swags of the festoons were created on the machine you see the woman working at in the painting from the Groman Museum. The weaving of the gimp, which is the top portion or the header, if you will, that would have been woven, that was the part that would have been woven on the jacquard loom, and typically that would have been done by men. However, most of the final finishing processes of these trims were done by hand and done by women. So for instance, the tassel um, in this particular uh, example was created by and attached to the rest of the trim by the skilled hands of a woman. And I believe that's the type of work we see these women doing in this image from Horstman and Sons. If you take a, a closer look, and I tried to zoom in on this grainy image, um, but the woman with the dark hair and her back to us has a length of, of fringed trimming hanging in front of her on the table there. And over her lap, you're seeing some yarns. And I think that what she's doing is fashioning um, those yarns into tassels and then attaching them to the fringe that she's got in front of her. I also suspect that the hank of materials just to her left sitting on the table there may be pre-made tassels that are ready to go onto that fringe. The Maurer samples that are housed in the collection offer some amazing insight into the numerous steps, materials, and costs involved in creating these trims and fringes. Many of our samples, we're so lucky that these have these notations, many of our samples are attached to cards with handwritten notes detailing the production of the piece. So this is the written notation in relation to the trim on the previous slide. So, um, you know, sometimes that handwriting is a little bit difficult to decipher. I've read a lot of students' handwritten notes in my day. Sometimes I still have trouble reading some of those words, but I, I could make enough out here to know that the silk that comprised this tassel on the previous slide, that was a considerable expense because it is 100% silk. Um, as was the plated cord, so that cord that the women would have created in the previous slide, we saw the woman working at the machine. And uh, this particular trim, um, a yard of it would have required 57 dozen balls covered in silk. All totaled, uh, that trim would cost in, uh, in when it was made in the late um, 18, 19th century, $3.57 per yard. And that would amount to just over $100 a yard in our money today, which is a steep cost now or then, considering that to trim draperies or other household furnishings, one would need to purchase many yards. And actually, Emily and I just noticed in looking at the case in one of the trims we have um, that that price per yard was $4.90. So nearly $200 a yard, really extravagantly, you know, very high status pieces that are being created at Mauer. You know, it's interesting because it seems that there is an acknowledgement of this high cost cost in a note that's underneath the calculations, which read, and I've got it highlighted and blown up a little bit here, it says, reduced without crepines and only one row of balls cost $3.06, so they've shaved a little bit off of it, still gonna be pretty expensive. The first census taken at the turn of the 20th century showed that Philadelphia outranked any other city in the United States when it came to the monetary value of the hosiery being produced here. Hosiery was big business in our city. The hosiery industry began in Germantown soon after Penn's arrival in 1683. When it was a cottage industry, Men wove stockings on knitting frames and women sold the products. But I will note that when we look at an image like this one from Diderot's encyclopedia, that man on the left-hand side of the screen would not be knitting on that frame if not for the yarns that the woman on the right-hand side was supplying. And Emily tells me uh, that the particular tool that she's using is called an umbrella swift. 
and it's used to facilitate the winding of yarns into a ball. These knitting frames were created, uh, created fabric using a method of knitting called warp knitting, which if you're a hand knitter is pretty different from that type of knitting done with two needles. Warp knitting is more like weaving in that rows are built vertically using many warp ends as opposed to the one end you use when you're knitting. So that's as far as I'm gonna go with that because trying to explain warp knitting to myself, let alone to you, we'd be here for, I don't know, a couple more hours. Suffice it to say that these were incredible machines and we're lucky enough to have one in our collection. This knitting frame was made in Lyon, France and brought to the American colonies by a man named Godfrey Miller around 1763. He himself was born in Germany where he was trained as a frame knitter. And eventually he and his two brothers who were also weavers immigrated to America arriving in 1763 in Philadelphia. And they set up shop, they set up operations at that point in the German town neighborhood. Our knitting frame was donated by one of the descendants of the Miller family and is one of three known to exist in the United States. Hosiery was also made in the form of a tube on a rotary or circular knitting machine. Fit when using these types of machines was often an issue. Um, these machines were not able to create hosiery that followed the natural contours of the leg. Instead, the shape was achieved during the dyeing and blocking process. So the dyed wet socks would be placed over a flat wooden board in the shape of a leg. You might've seen these in antique shops uh, and allowed to dry. And when they were dry, they retained this leg shape until wear and body heat caused them to lose their shape and sag. And now I'm gonna turn it over to Emily, who is going to share with us some information about knitting and tools. So this knitting machine that we have in our collection is called the Ainsley Auto Knitter. And it's an example of this kind of circular knitting machine um, that is capable of shaping to create a toe and a heel in socks. Shaping was made possible through a method called short rows and which is a term that we use today to discuss strategically adding extra rows of knitted stitches to the fabric. And although this machine could shape the toe and heel with short rows, it was not capable of increasing the width of the tube of fabric to accommodate for the contours of the leg. This specific machine in our collection is a later model produced in the 20th century. However, machines similar to this were also used in the 19th century. This machine has a very useful attachment called a ribber. And this allowed for a classic sock cuff to be created um, that by nature of the stitch structure would allow the sock to be tighter around the top portion of the leg, accentuating the fit a bit more. Um, for this knitting machine to operate, the handle crank on the side would be continuously turned to knit one row of stitches um, as the feeder giving the yarn to the needles was pulled through a tensioning system above the machine to ensure even stitch sizes throughout the garment. Weights would be attached to the first few courses of knit stitches to guide the hosiery down through the center of the machine. And some patterning and stitch manip manipulation techniques were achievable on this machine, such as the classic Argyle sock that we often see. And as touched upon before, women worked on these machines as ho at home since they were compact um, they would often make products at home for an additive side income. The image on the left shows an advertisement for just that. Although the location on the advertisement is specified as London, women often, often used machinery at home. Um, sorry, women also often used this machinery at home as a common occurrence in the Philadelphia region as well. Contrasting home production is the machine on the right, which is a circular knitting machine also used for creating hosiery, but this machine was capable of knitting faster with more yarns and at a larger scale. It is more mechanized um, and is used in mills to commercially produce hosiery. Oh, 
Owen Osborne's Atlas Knitting Mill was located at the, at the corner of Somerset and North 4th Street. This address puts the mill in the West Kensington neighborhood of Philadelphia. In the late 19th and early 20th century, Kensington was the epicenter of the stocking industry in Philadelphia. The earliest mills there opened in 1870. Atlas employed 200 hands, and as the Hexhammer General Survey noted in 1887, half of those were girls. Just a few years later, at the end of the 19th century, 166 of their employees were women and nearly all of them were under the age of 21. In 1887, they were a mill that produced both knit and sew hosiery and woven carpets. The term knit and sew is a clue that might indicate that the company was using a newer type of knitting machine, not the uh, circular or rotary knitting machines that Emily's just explained. The full fashion stocking machine was originally invented in Nottingham, England in 1864. And this is the German American hosiery company um, using these full frame, full fashion um, knitting machines. The machine made its way to the United States and in 1887, the hosiery mill Nicker and Wessons on Tulip Street in Kensington was the first Philadelphia mill to start using it. The stockings knitted on these machines were knit flat in the shape of a leg. And then after they came off the knitting machine, they were sewn up the back, giving them that line up the back that we usually associate with mid 20th century is my stocking, are my stockings straight? The fit of these stockings was a huge, huge improvement over the earlier circular knit types. Because of the more complex process of creating them, they were also a lot more expensive. The creation process for full fashion stockings was a multi-step one. Men knit the legs of the stockings. Women undertook the key steps of joining different sections of the stockings and in the finishing process. Women carried out what was referred to or what was known as a, tech, uh, a process called topping, which refers to the act of transferring the product from the legger machine, the part that knits the legs, which was done by men, to the footer machine. Um, so this sort of transferring from one to the next. Women were also charged with operating the machines that knit the heels and toes. And again, that final step in the process, using a sewing machine to create the seam up the back. So according to the census of manufacturers put out by the Bureau of Business and Labor in 1890, the average hours per week um, in a knitting mill at that time would have been right around 60 hours. For the work they performed in 1890, the top earning bracket for men was 20 to $25 per week. No woman was earning wages that high. In fact, according to the statistics in this same census, only a few women were making 10 to $12 per week with the vast majority of women earning somewhere between three and $7 per week. Nationally, the, weekly, the average weekly wage for men over the age of 16 working at a knitting mill was $8.90. And for women, the national average was uh, $6.01. So in either way, in any way you slice it, women were making less. So uh, the, the highest quality full fashion stockings were made out of silk. And as I've detailed, companies like Horstman, companies like Maurer, those trims we saw in the previous slides, were utilizing silk. And there were even some attempts here in Philadelphia, and this is quite early on, even back into the 18th century, to cultivate silk locally, raising silkworms, processing this lustrous filament fiber. And according to the summary of the report on condition of woman and child wage earners in the United States, quite a title, uh, that was put out by the US government in 1905, Pennsylvania, along with New Jersey, accounted for 72% of the 
of the total number of silk looms and 70.6% of the silk spindles in the United States. So this was a big area for silk production and textiles. This report specifically analyzed and looked at 36 silk mills in Pennsylvania and found that the numbers of silk workers exploded between the, between the years 1870, excuse me, and 1900. In 1870, within these 36 mills, there were 655 female employees over the age of 16 years. In 1900, so just 30 years later, there were 11,505. At the turn of the century, although in total, Pennsylvania had more silk mills and factories than any other state in this area, they paid their workers less. <laughs> in Pennsylvania, silk and silk goods mills and factories, men over the age of 16 on average were taking home around $8.98 per week, while women over 16 were taking home a mere $5.44 per week. In silk mills, Women and girls could often be found carrying out the semi-skilled jobs of winding. That was one of the, the terms for one of the tasks they had. And this was a task that was strenuous. I mean, it, it required almost continuous standing. And when they were doing this job of winding, they kept an eye on the yarns, looking for broken threads, which would cause the machinery to come to a complete halt and um, tying them together when they found those broken yarns. Women were also involved in the first round of spinning for the silk, which was classified as another semi-skilled job. At any given time, a woman carrying out this task was tending between 400 to 1,000 spindles. And when I said that to Emily earlier, her eyes just got big because, of course, she's done these tasks before. Women, took on this, women did take on the skilled job of some types of warping. So warping is the key step in the weaving process. It's the building you know, sort of block of the actual fabric, creating the actual fabric on the loom. However, there are different types of warping. And one of the tasks, uh, one of the types of warping is called horizontal warping. And this was one that was always apparently done by men. As the Bulletin of the Bureau of Labor Statistics tells us, quote, a man, because of his greater physical power, is able to turn out more work than a woman. And although men command 50% 50 50 higher wages, their labor is considered cheaper and men are more highly skilled and competent, end quote. Ouch. <laughs> so apparently uh, horizontal warping the kind that men did, was used more in New Jersey, while here in Pennsylvania, other warping methods, something called Swiss warping, which I actually don't know what that means, was more prevalent, largely because they could hire women and girls for less money. So the Sacriotes Mill and Silk Company was based in upstate New York, and in 1879, the company built a factory on Columbia Avenue in Philadelphia. The reach of their products was national, according to Dockham's American Report and Directory. In 1891, their three mills were filling sales rooms as far west as Chicago and in four other major metropolitan cities. Their Philadelphia location operated with 175 looms. Around 1880, the company had 225 employees who, according to the Scranton Republican, noted uh, they noted that these employees were mostly girls who were primarily producing what were called trams and organzines. They also produced broad dress silks, fringes, and sewings. Now, in reading through that list of products that were supplied um, from the Sacriot milk uh, mills, um, I came across a couple that didn't I, I was unfamiliar with. Um, trams and organzines. So the Scranton Republic jumps in here and, and fills in some of my uh, lack, you know, my uh, lack of understanding of some of these earlier terms. So in an article published in 1891, um, they described what the factory was doing, saying, quote, the factory had been fitted up with machinery designed for the manufacture of raw silk into filling and warp, or 
tram, and organzine, as they were technically called, end quote. So tram is just another word for filling or weft yarns and organzine for warp yarns. Again, the basic building blocks of any textile that's woven. Not the same for knits, but for wovens. And so I'm gonna turn it over to Emily one more time, who will tell us about some of the tools we have in our collection for weaving in mills and factories. So as was just explained, um, woven fabrics are constructed from two components, warp yarns and weft yarns. And the weft yarns are often also called filling yarns. The interaction between these two yarns is shown in the diagram to the top left, um, where the warp yarns are vertical throughout the fabric and the weft yarns run horizontally in the fabric. The weft yarns intertwine with the warp yarns by traveling underneath some and over others. Different combinations of this action are what achieve patterning in a woven fabric. The shuttles seen sprawled across the screen are the vessels used to insert the weft yarns between the warp yarns. The yarns that were created by women through the processes I described with the first collection of fiber processing tools are wound onto bobbins, which are the tools shown in the bottom right corner. These bobbins holding the yarns to be used in the weft are inserted into the shuttles and the loose end of the yarn from the bobbin is pulled through a tensioning system within the shuttle. Inside the shuttles on either side of the bobbin are materials like lamb's wool or a series of plastic rings to help the control to help control the spin of the bobbin as the yarns were uh, inserted between the warp yarns. The shuttle with the plastic rings on the inside is from the 20th century, helping to show how advancements in, in materiality progressed the design and functionality of these tools. Before weaving on a loom begins, the spools are used again, but this time, however, they're used to draw warp yarns through tensioning and sorting devices um, straight onto the warp beam of the weaving loom. And then as the process of weaving ensues, warp yarns are gradually released from the beam, giving the weaver more to work with. And these types of looms that weavers were working on in the 19th century were often power looms. And the shuttle that I showed uh, previously explained, uh, showed and explained previously, are specifically power loom shuttles. The shuttles are heavier and have metal tips uh, for protection of the tool and have quality control devices within them. These power looms, such as the one on the left, uh, were powered by steam or water to beat the weft yarns into the fabric that the weaver inserted using the shuttles. An example of a beautifully intricate textile woven on a, mach a machine such as this one um, is shown on the right. And although the use of these looms uh, was a more automated process than hand weaving, this work was still extremely strenuous and a lot, of, a lot was demanded of textile workers as production rose due to industrial advance advancements. At the peak of production, it is said that, quote, one person can attend two of these looms at a time each loom weaving between 20 and 40 yards in a single day, end quote. Although most of the names of the individual women working in textile manufacturing in the 19th century have been lost to time, by telling their stories, their contributions haven't. But by piecing together clues, and this is what I maybe love most about my jobs, my job, um, looking at, uh, I feel like I have a lot of jobs sometimes, <laughs> piecing together these clues, census reports, photographs, newspaper ads, business directories, and even the tools they worked with, a more complete narrative of the essential roles women played in the growth and sustained dominance of textile manufacturing in Philadelphia in the 19th century emerges. And of course, in our time that we've had here with you this evening, we've only just uncovered the tip of the iceberg. And what's continually exciting about the work we do with the textile and costume collection is that you don't know, you don't know what clue the next box you open is going to drop into your lap. With 125,000 objects, there are many boxes I've never seen the inside of. So I'm excited to see what's coming my way. 
So, you know, how will these clues that may come to us in the, in the future be better to help us understand the pivotal roles that women have played in textile manufacturing? So in closing, I'll, I'll come back to a point I made near the beginning of this presentation. Maybe now we'll spare a moment to think about those who work to create the textiles we encounter on a, on a daily basis. And, and when we can, let's you know, name those designers. And so here we have, again, circling back around to our university and thinking about these uh, aspiring textile designers. Here we have on the left-hand side of the screen, Lily Cartwright, who is working on a Dobby loom that was actually used in the early days of our university to train those first graduates from the Philadelphia Textile School. And it's been updated with computer attachments. Here you can see this computer screen along with the very old looking wood there. Um, but the basic principles about weaving that Emily spoke about apply. And our very own on the other side of the screen, Emily Radomsky, knitting a strip of needle fabric. It's almost the end of the semester, so she's been busy at work. Um, knitting a strip of needle rib fabric on a PASAP V-bed machine, which comes from the 1970s. So whether in the 19th or the 21st century, the tools that pass through the hands of these women, these utilitarian objects that serve a functional purpose and yet have this air of beauty to them, can remind successive generations of the rich history that weaves our city together. You know I had to throw that in there. So I want to just say, and you know, on behalf of myself and Emily, thank you so much for spending part of your evening with us. I always love to show off the treasures I have the pleasure of working with every day. I love my job. I love that I get to live with this history every day. Before we get to any questions you might have, and I hope you have some, I'll take a moment to tell you how you can see more of our collection. So the address for our blog is there, followthethreadblog.com. Thank you, Blanche, for pointing that out. Um, we have new posts about every other week. Um, and if you subscribe, there's a little button on the right-hand side of the screen when you go there. I promise uh, we'll, we'll send emails about those new postings, but those are basically the only emails we send. So don't worry about, we won't flood your email box. You can also access all of the objects we've digitized through the online platform JSTOR, and you can see that web address listed after our digital archive. And there you can scroll through and see the over 4,000 objects that we have digitized or search using some of the keywords that you've heard this evening. And finally, if you do social media, um, we are on Instagram, and uh, Instagram is often where we post our newest and most update-to-date finds, so see it there before anywhere else. Um, you can uh, find us at the Design Center. And with that, I will say thank you again, um, and on behalf of em myself and Emily, and we'll be happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you. Thank you so much, Emily and Jade. That was great. It was really, really interesting. Um, I think we have time for a couple of questions. Do we have any from the audience or any of that have come through on the Q&A, Blanche, that we want to get to? Thank you, everyone, for being here tonight. Our first question is from Patricia Owens. Patricia actually asked two questions. Can you visit the Jefferson Collection? collection and does the flax plant used for clothing provide the flax seeds that are popular to eat? Oh, I think they have so the question, the first question was about if you can come to visit our collection. And the answer is yes, but <laughs> um, we are not open to the public in that you can't just walk through our doors. We don't have open hours, but if you use that email address at the end, that was at the end of the presentation, I would be more than happy to have you in and show you 
basically whatever you would like to look at um, because we have a little bit of everything. So please, and if you, you know, didn't have a chance to jot down that email address, if you go to our blog or if you just type in Textile and Costume Collection East Falls, you will find us some way. But email me and I would be thrilled to um, have you up and looking at our pieces. Our collection is a study collection, meaning that we're a hands-on collection. Um, Emily took a class that I teach a few years ago. And what's so great about our collection is that we bring that history to life. Um, and so when we talk about things like the 18th century textiles, I bring out an 18th century silk and say, you know, here, touch this. Um, um, so please, we would, I would love to show some of our pieces off to you. And then the second question, and I don't know if I know the answer to this, but um, we'll reiterate it and maybe something will pop into my head. Um, the flax that's used for the production of fiber, is it the same used for the flax that, you're ta you, should, that you can take that might do good things for you health-wise? Do you know, Emily? I'm not entirely certain, but when I was looking at images for the slide presentation, I did see that there was an image of the flax plant, like the raw flax plant next to the seed. So I would assume that the two go together and that they are derived from each other. But um, in specifically speaking about the flax plant in accordance to textile fibers, um, it creates linen fabrics. So that's what the flax plant is used for. Thank you. Our next question is from Jenna Osman who asks, was the 19th century textile manufacturing in Philly reliant on cotton from the South? There were hosiery mills that were cotton hosiery mills and not so much silk. Um, you know, it's the, the way that we chose um, the mills uh, that we spoke about this evening was, can we find information about work, women working there? And so in terms of the cotton mills, um, we had less evidence of women working there. Not that it doesn't exist, it's just that we haven't found the right place to look yet. Um, and so, you know, I can only imagine with the amount of cotton that's coming from the South that some of it's not ending up here, but it's something that we'd wanna sort of dig more into to find the specifics out about that. But yes, certainly cotton as a fiber was being used for hosiery and textiles made in this city. First, I'd like to say um, thank you to everyone who's attended virtually tonight. Um, there are more questions than we have time for, but I think this is the third inquiry into your necklace. Um, <laughs> so I just saw one pop up in the chat. So if you could quickly speak to that. Um, <laughs> That's great. Um, so it's something I, I'm, I'm a collector of big chunky necklaces. And um, this is actually, I have two versions of this. I think what I should do because so many people love it is do a tutorial on how to make it. Because really all it is, is like um, poster board paper covered in scraps of fabric. So we all, well, I have a lot of scraps of fabric around. We can wrap those around our poster board um, and then take basically DMC floss and make what look kind of like to me, um, uh, if you know buttons from the 18th century, they kind of look like deadhead buttons, those beautifully embroidered buttons. But um, yeah, so uh, I'm, I'm seeing a workshop emerge of where we're gonna take some scraps and make necklaces like this. Should we do that? We'll do that at the design center. Okay, all right. Thank you. <laughs> And a few people have asked about what they can see when they visit the uh, mini exhibit currently up in the Logan Room at the Library Company. Unfortunately, the um, sewing machines looms were too large to bring in, but we do have some small cases with some textiles and some tools. We encourage everyone to come to 1314 Locust Street during the hours of 9 a.m. to 4.45, uh, Monday through Friday. Uh, if you bring proof of vaccination, we are happy to have you. Um, do we have room for one more question? Sure. Okay, I think uh, Mackenzie Coker has a really interesting question. Was the textile industry in Philadelphia representative of the wider American industry or did it scale cause differentiation? I'm not sure if y'all can speak to that, but. 
here's what I'll speak to. So how is it unique or how is it different? Yeah, um, or how is it the same, I guess I should say. And what I kept finding in my research is that, you know, so another big manufacturing city in, this in the 19th century is Lowell, Massachusetts. And what I kept seeing as a comment was that in Lowell, everything was done in one like space, like one location, like all of the processing and the spinning and the winding and the weaving and the finishing and the dyeing was all kind of done in house. Whereas one of the things that made Philadelphia unique was that these things were kind of netted out over the city so that you would have a mill that specialty was the processing and spitting. And then you would have another mill where the specialty was dyeing and another one where finishing. And so it was like sort of more compartmentalized. It was more widespread around and in different areas of the city because it wasn't all housed under one roof. Um, so there's, yeah, there's some, you know, cause a lot gets written about Lowell and the Lowell, you know, factory girls and, um, all of that. But, um, we, seems like we did things a little bit different. Um, you know, the basic principles of how you weave and the tools that you were using the same, but, uh, sort of the setup of the organization a little bit different. Yep. Okay. 